the little plumber's son that came out of the ditch at eight years old and became so sweet and became a three-time NWA World Heavyweight Champion wrestling all over the world. Who? that's funky. That's the American Dream. The American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, one of the most iconic figures in the history of professional wrestling, starting in wrestling back in the late 60s, and wrestling all the way pretty much until the latter years of his life. And also, so influential on the mic, in the ring, behind the scenes, booking for Championship Wrestling from Florida for Eddie Graham, booking for Jim Crocker Promotions, helping grow the new crop in WWE NXT, able to turn the polka dots into cash, because he was willing and absolutely able to to shove those polka dots right down the throats of Vince McMahon, Bruce Prichard, and his circle jerk crew. And I bet Bruce really goddamn liked it. That piece of shit. But Dusty Rhodes was always willing to get the most out of anybody. And I'm not saying all of his ideas worked. There was the Chamber of Horrors. But, you know, Dusty Rhodes still so memorable. Despite the fact that his in-ring time in the WWF wasn't all that long. I mean, it was only about 18 months. But you have to wonder... As big, as grand, as legendary, as iconic as Dusty Rhodes is and is seen by so many fans. What if, what if that little plumber's son that came out of the ditch at eight years old that had an American dream was able to take that American dream to the bright lights of New York City into MSG and beyond? What if Dusty Rhodes had taken Vince McMahon's offer about 41 years ago? Where would the wrestling world have been? Let's discuss that. I'm John Redlin with my real honest thoughts on what if Dusty Rose took Vince McMahon's offer in 1983. So, yeah, I'm bringing these back. I'm not going to be doing a ton of them, but I enjoy doing these. I had this thought on basically just talking about this one. I might do a couple others coming up. Uh, another one is Jim Crockett Promotions centric uh, about Star K 1987 succeeding. <laughs> but that being said, Dusty Rhodes at the end of the day, did make the right decision staying in Jim Crockett Promotions, even though you could argue he might have earned more money in the short term working for Vince, would he have been able to make that work? <laughs> Who goddamn knows? But I'm here to discuss what would have happened had that been the case. Now, a brief history of Dusty Rhodes' life. He was born in 1945. And basically, you know, he, he did have, I forget what the <clears throat> condition was, but it was something in his hip. And he was not sure if his parents weren't even sure he was going to be able to like, you know, fully walk, but he just like, you know, basically lived with it for a number of years. And then he would excel in athletics. He would get into professional wrestling because he would watch professional wrestling with his dad. You know, we'd go get some, uh, you know, chicken fried steak, we, uh, iced tea. We, he cash a check. We go watch some wrestling. And he also got his <laughs> rapport from, you know, the, preachers, you know, setting up the revival tents, Thunderbolt Patterson. People say, oh yeah, you know, he took it from Thunderbolt Patterson. Well, Dusty was have actually able to work with people unlike Thunderbolt Patterson. Bless him, but Dusty was able to make it work because he was able to cross and, you know, work, talk, and draw people into the building. Now, that being said, Dusty Rhodes, basically his first big break was with Dirty Dick Murdoch, and that was in the AWA, the Texas Outlaws. And they were really, really good. They were really good. I mean, granted, that was when uh, the AWA was doing their studio stuff. <laughs> but you think about just how well they could work with just about anybody. But even Dusty was like, hey, you know, I see those old white BVDs, you know, of uh, Dick Murdoch. I'm in the hotel. And I'm like, you know what? I got to go do something else. I got to do something else, Dicky baby. I got, we didn't, we, he said something like, you know, we didn't part ways as far as brothers, but we did part ways as far as her careers um, interacting. And Dick Murdoch actually would come back, I think, in 88 for <laughs> Crockett. So, you know, and Dusty was booking at that point there, so it kind of makes sense. Um, but Dusty would, you know, continue to grow and become the American dream. He would go to Florida, and he would also make other shots. I mean, you had the Atlanta TV. You just ha you had this just multiple piece of clay and that's not making fun of his physique because in, really until his later years yeah he wasn't toned but he was in pretty good shape and he also could move he could dance he could do the shuck and drive he could do the bionic elbow but he was a heel at first and then the packs on nan you know turn along with gary hart all that 
I, I the Florida presentation of like <laughs> recording the commentary over like a sports film or like a you know a sporting event always kind of you know um, like con didn't confuse me but kind of threw me off. But you know what, Gordon Sully calling it and Dusty talking about what he did, <clears throat> they did present it like a real sport. It was just always a little bit weird to me. But he I believe turned sometime <clears throat> in the mid seventies. He would, you know, make appearances in New York. Obviously, Vince Senior would have loved him, but Vince Junior, you know, Vince McMahon, the pervert, by the way, the dirty pervert that he is—that's the nicest way I can put it. At the time, did see a lot uh, in Dusty Rhodes, and how could you not? I mean, born in '45, by the time he faced off against superstar Billy Graham, he was in his early 30s. They had that uh, trilogy of matches, <clears throat> great stuff, and it, Billy Graham could never work. He could bump decently, but he had the he had the rap, he had the rapport. <laughs> Dusty had his, you know, his rapport, and they were able to talk people into Madison Square Garden. And I mean, go back and watch those matches. The crowds were going insane. It was nuts. And Dusty, at that point, if Dusty had wanted to make the move, could have gone. And I think Vince Senior would have used him uh, gladly. But he also had respect for Eddie Graham. <clears throat> Dusty was Eddie's big draw. He would go out occasionally so other people could be built up. But Dusty Rose basically had his pick of where he could go. <clears throat> now, you think about the fact that he was still working in Florida. <clears throat> he was doing, he was, you know, making these appearances. He would make appearances in 84 <clears throat> for Bill Watts, mainly in the Superdome. <clears throat> but he would, you know, he would wrestle in Houston for Paul Bosch because he had tremendous respect for Paul Bosch. How could you not? And also, I believe his mother lived there. And some of these facts come from uh, Jim Cornette's podcast and, you know, Cornette and Brian Last talking about this stuff. But also, you can just see from the footage, Dusty was beloved everywhere. <clears throat> Dusty would work in Japan. He would work so many places, and as beloved as he was, he could have his pick of where he wanted to go. Now, he had gone as far as he could have in Florida. <laughs> Eddie Graham was having his issues. Jim Crockett was starting to build up because Georgia Championship Wrestling had been shut down at that point. Ole came in and said... We're, uh, don't do this anymore. What? Any of it. We're just shutting down. So, essentially, Dusty Dusty could have gone to the AWA if he really wanted to, but would Vern have let him book and let him have you know the control he needed? No, and I don't think Dusty would have been able to turn business around there. They had Hogan at that point in 83. They were going to lose Hogan at the end of 83, <clears throat> but to take a look at the WWF side, they had superstar Billy Graham, Bob Backlund beat him and would hold the championship outside of losing it to Inoki a couple times, once or twice, whatever it is, whatever you want to believe. Backlund was still the champion, and Vince decided that he was going to go with Hogan. So Vince did end up going with Hogan, and they had big box office, and Hogan was a young enough guy at that point that it worked. It absolutely did work. I mean, you, you can't argue that... It wasn't something, you know, as cartoonish as Hogan was. Hogan could talk people into the building, even though he's a fucking racist. Even though that, he could talk people into the goddamn building. And Hogan drew money, tremendous money. But Vince wanted to have somebody as a temple once he took over the company from his dad, you know, sometime in the early 80s. I mean, it was, you know, he did the buyout thing, <clears throat> couldn't go with Jimmy Snuka. Could have gotten Kerry Von Erich, and then that would have flamed out quickly. And even though Kerry had the look, did Kerry have did Kerry had the physical charisma? Did Kerry have the work? No, but they need the work. No, but would Kerry have been somebody that you would want to make the figurehead of your company? Uh, no, no, because as um, <clears throat> Rush said, the modern day warrior, mean mean strike. Kerry lost his foot because of his bike. I can't help it. But Dusty Rhodes <clears throat> decided to make the moves of Jim Crockett Promotions. He was there for Starcade 83, got the idea from, you know, the big events that Eddie Graham promoted. And not that Eddie Graham was the only one that promoted this stuff. <clears throat> the last tango in Tampa, AWA was doing their Super Sunday stuff. There were big spectaculars coming up. <clears throat> they still want to have that territorial mindset where they had peaks, but they didn't want the peak and then a drop. But Jim Crockett Promotions was growing, <clears throat> growing exponentially. It was going from just the Carolinas of Virginia. They were starting to make outdates. They were starting to go in the Northeast a little bit more. <clears throat> it was going to expand. <clears throat> and Dusty's ideas would help carry that. They would also help hasten some of the decline. But 
to see what Dusty was able to do, he helped grow Jim Crockett Promotions. But if Dusty had gone <clears throat> to uh, Vince, if he had taken his offer, one, Jim Crockett probably could have gotten somebody else to book. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know who else he could have gotten to book. And Jim Crockett still would have been able to do some good stuff. And they did need some new talent, and it ended up working out for the better that <clears throat> Dusty went. But if Dusty had taken Vince's offer, that would have meant Hogan would have stayed in the AWA. Dusty, at that point, in 83, and we're talking late 83, so he would have been 38 years old. <clears throat> so, at that he would have been a little bit older than Hogan, and Dusty did have more miles on him, because he'd been wrestling since the late 60s. And, yes, it could have been, it could have certainly been something that could have backfired, but <clears throat> Dusty would have been able to talk them into the building, and he would have been able to be more sports entertainment than a lot of the guys that uh, Vince would have gone with. But at the same time, Vince didn't want to go with so much blood. Dusty had to go with that realistic as aspect rather, of blood <clears throat> and violence and realism. And while Dusty could have been moldable to an extent, I don't think that he would have wanted to go there unless he could have been the booker and Vince would have had the final say. But let's say that everything could have worked out. Let's say Dusty would have gotten the right amount of money, <clears throat> the right amount of control, and Vince had been able to go national. Would it have gone as well as with the Rock and Wrestling Connection had Hogan not been there? Maybe to an extent. Because Albano was the big key. That's the one thing that people tend to forget. Captain Lou Albano, the big key as far as you know, being in Cindy Lauper videos, especially girls just want to have fun, <clears throat> and being a key component of the Rock and Wrestling Connection. Dusty would have been just fine, would have fit in there just fine, even though he was more Southern, he was more wrestling. He could have been sports entertainment enough. He could have worked WrestleMania, and WrestleMania would have been a success. And Dusty could have ran with that <clears throat> for a few years. But the thing is, it comes down to age. Dusty was 38 when that offer would have been made. So he was starting late 83, early 84, whatever it is. Whatever you want to go with. <clears throat> whatever he could have worked out with Eddie Graham. And who knows? Maybe Vince Jr. would have been able to work with Eddie Graham and would have been able to say, hey, you know, let's let's have a working agreement here and let's just go with it. Fortunately, Eddie Graham took his own life, sadly, in on Super Bowl Sunday of 1985. Dusty, however, he could have worked that tour because <clears throat> he worked a lot of tours. He wasn't home for Dustin <clears throat> and I believe his old his oldest daughter at the time. He wasn't home as often. Now, the Great American Bash Tour wouldn't have been necessarily uh, something that would have been <laughs> happening without Dusty, and it certainly would have affected Jim Crockett Promotions' as business, but with the right people, they still could have grown, <clears throat> and maybe not spent nearly as much money as they ended up making, and Dusty would have made oodles of money in the WWF. The big issue with all this is, it goes back to age, it goes back to mileage, it goes back to the fact that Dusty was nearly 20 years into his career by the time the first WrestleMania popped up. Because <clears throat> if I remember right, I think he started in 65, 66. So, 45. <clears throat> by the time we got to, say, WrestleMania 3, he would have been he would have been 41. Because he was born in October of 1945, so he wouldn't have been 42 yet. That's how the calendars work. He would have been able to maybe give Vince some <clears throat> good ideas, because Vince had this idea of being Disney and being, you know, the... <clears throat> the Walt Disney of wrestling and being the biggest uh, entity. Dusty might not wanted to shut so many territories out, so that could have been a conflict. Dusty, however, talking him into the building, <clears throat> could have had a great team with Andre. I don't know if him and Andre working together in a program would have necessarily worked, <clears throat> but you could have had him work, could have had him work with Orndorff. Dusty and Orndorff in 1984, 85, shut up and take my money. I would have fucking loved to have seen that. He could have worked with Greg the Hammer Valentine. Maybe not Brutus Beefcake so much because Dusty's not a fucking magician and Brutus Beefcake could never work. But he, you know, Barry Windham would have been there, maybe. Because part of the thing is Barry Windham ended up going to the WWF and being part of the U.S. Express and would bounce back and forth. And Barry Windham was somebody that Dusty thought very highly of. A lot of people that were from Florida might not gone to Crockett, might have gone to the WWF. <laughs> Larry Zabisco was in, well, he was in Florida. <clears throat> Actually, no, I think he might have been in the, he might have gone to the AWA in, you know, sometime in 85. But he could have been somebody <clears throat> that would have, 
he could have been somebody that Dusty could have worked with if Zabisco would have been able to trust Vince and that kind of stuff, and they could have worked their things out. Dusty could have had <clears throat> numerous feuds, tag team run. He could have, um, they maybe could have had him and Tony Atlas team up. That would have been nice to see. It could have gotten Tony Atlas away from known assaulter uh, <clears throat> Rocky Johnson. Fuck Rocky Johnson, glad he's dead. Dusty could have worked Mania 1, 2, 3. <clears throat> By Mania 4, though, he would have been beat up. I don't think that he would have lasted past Mania 5, maybe. Because think about it. That schedule, the hard rings... The fact that even though Dusty could bump <clears throat> and Dusty wanted to have the classic matches, he could tone it down. He could have the seven, eight-minute matches, the entertainment aspect. But without the ability to bleed and without the ability to basically have people see more pain on his face, he could only go so far there. So, would he have had the Intercontinental Championship? Maybe. I don't think he ever would have been the WWF champion, though. <clears throat> unless, you know, unless Hogan wasn't brought in, they might have made him the champion, but he wouldn't have had a four-year run. There would have been no way to give him a four-year run. Maybe a year, maybe two. But then, <clears throat> who do you go with? Who do you go with as that? Can you work out a deal with Slaughter where Slaughter maybe has a Hasbro deal <clears throat> and you slot him in against Dusty because a heel Slaughter or a face Slaughter against a heel Dusty Rhodes? You could have flipped him around. You could have done something. This is just stuff I'm pulling basically out of my ass. I'm just trying to come up with ways to justify Dusty turning down the Jim Crockett Promotions offer to go to WWF. For the short term, would have worked out great. For the long term, I don't think he would have wrestled past 89 because of wear and tear and just his ideas and what he wanted to do. He wanted to be the man and Vince would have only allowed somebody to be, you know, to be so much of the man as far as like what his vision was compared to what his star's vision was. Hogan was moldable <clears throat> and was willing to go with that. And as great as Slaughter would have been, I don't think Slaughter would have lasted as long. And Dusty would have flamed out in a few years. It wouldn't have lasted as long as it did with Hogan. Because with Hogan, <clears throat> they tried switching it to Warrior. It didn't work, so Hogan came back. Or Hogan came back in the main event scene and was champion of Mania 7 after losing at Mania 6 and carried that on and everything. And Dusty... Meanwhile, <clears throat> after his brief run in WWF from the summer of 89 to very early 1991, would go back. He would be the booker. <laughs> He'd be a backstage guy. He'd be an occasional wrestler. But he was getting to where, by the time he was teaming with Dustin, he was near 50. With his health issues and with his injuries and stuff like that, and he would work other shows. And <clears throat> he'd work on occasion, but he just, he just didn't have it because everybody, we all age. Father time catches up. So I would have loved to have seen what Dusty Rose would have been able to do as the tentpole of you know Vince McMahon's vision. But I honestly think that he made the right decision because <clears throat> I think it would have only been half the window that Hogan had because of age, because of presentation, because of what Dusty wanted to have <clears throat> and compared to what Vince was willing to give him. And Vince would have had to change a lot of what he ended up doing. Rock and Wrestling Connection still could have worked but he would have had to have had more blood. <clears throat> he would have had to have allowed Dusty to go out there and have more violent matches and have some stuff and get people drawn in and everything and have the physicality. Because <clears throat> that's really what it comes down to. Dusty Rhodes would have worked out in the short term, but would not have worked out as well as Hogan. That's just what. That's just the bottom line right there, and that's all due fucking respect to the legend that is Dusty Rhodes. Love Dusty Rhodes. <clears throat> so many memorable moments. He wouldn't have been able to even get the hard times promo thing. You have to wonder who Flair would have been able to fucking work against in Jim Crockett promotions. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, Dusty made the right decision. So in closing, if if Vince had uh, gotten Dusty, yeah, it would have worked out, but it wouldn't have worked out as well as it did with Hogan because it was just a match made in heaven. I'm not even talking about SummerSlam 91. Dusty, making more money, would have worked, <clears throat> but would he have made as much steady money as he ended up making by the time he got fired from WCW after Ted Turner bought the company. There would have been no Great American Bash. There would have been no Flair and Dusty. Unless Flair came over in 1988. And Dusty was still doing that. But at that point with Dusty being that beat up from the giant touring schedule. And the hard rings. Would the Flair-Dusty matches have been as good? No. 
Would we have gotten to see, you know, the rise of Nikita Koloff? Would we have gotten to see Magnum TA? What would he, we have seen in Jim Crockett Promotions? I'm not saying Jim Crockett Promote or Jim Crockett Jr. was an idiot. I'm just saying that he wasn't exactly somebody that <clears throat> could run things without a smart person booking. And for better or worse, Dusty was the best person to book that whole goddamn thing. Now, he was burned out. And there are things I'll talk about in the Starcade one where he ended up um, <clears throat> booking himself um, on top too much to the point the fans were getting sick of it. But Dusty was somebody that Vince could have worked with, <laughs> should have worked with. I would have loved to have seen Dusty Rhodes in his prime, or at least in as much of his prime as he had left, <clears throat> helping run things as the, you know, figure, as the main, you know, guy in WWF. At the end of the day, though, Dusty made the right decision. <clears throat> it just would have been interesting. It's a nice little what if. So I would like to know what you think Dusty's ceiling would have been. Do you think Dusty would have succeeded in WWF? How long do you think he would have succeeded? Let me know in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rithlin. I'll see you soon.